Hey, what's up guys? My name is Jeremy. Welcome to part 3, and by now you probably know I'm in love with Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Over this series of videos, I've been analyzing and breaking down what makes the 2D, 3D style of Spider-Verse so unique, and figure out how we can recreate it ourselves at home. In part 1, I talked about the basic ingredients of the aesthetic, and in part 2, I took a closer look at the character art and then modeled the basic foundation of my character. In this video, we kick it up to the next level and finish off the character by sculpting the face, modeling the outfit, adding hair, retopology, UVing, unwrapping, texturing, and finally rendering. We're also going to take an even deeper look at Sony's 3D character models, how they achieve the 2D line work, and talk about the style of the characters themselves. We've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. I realize that it's been a minute since the last video, so let's get caught up to speed. Spider-Verse crushed every award show it was nominated for, and the movie's now available on iTunes and Blu-ray. Did I buy it? Hell yeah, I bought it. And I watched all the extras and special features, and even listened to the director's commentary. When I started this series, there was a lot less information about the film, and now that some time has passed, the developers themselves have generously shared so much of the amazing work. There's fantastic insight available out there, so just know that this isn't meant to be an all-inclusive art breakdown. In this video, I'm going to just focus purely on the character art and finish off my Spider-Man. And I won't try to speak for the art team, so if you want to know the real facts, check out their websites and interviews. I'm just giving you the guided tour. Truthfully, I don't think I've ever seen a development team be so transparent with the art dump for production. Usually these things are locked away and control released into art books or special features. But I guess in this case, everyone knew that the art of this film was just so damn good and next level that it had to be celebrated and the artists who worked extremely hard deserve all the recognition they can get. As lead animator Joshua Beveridge puts it, I've never worked so hard on anything. It honestly required a piece of our souls to make. Writer and producer Phil Lord expands on that statement. You don't get to make that many of these things, so you want them to be as unique as possible. Figured, let's leave it all on the field. And that attitude towards production just bleeds through every frame of this movie. The evidence is everywhere, and you can tell so much love and creativity went into making this as awesome as it could be. Animation is such a powerful storytelling format, and capable of so much more than we're used to seeing from big studios. Spider-Verse was the first to break from the pack, and Sony Pictures will forever be remembered for that. And I really think they've done the world a service by blowing the lid off this thing and showing that you can still make successful movies while taking creative risks. Even the studio logos is one of the hypest things I've ever seen in my life. Yet, despite the infinite possibilities, particularly in the Western world, animation has yet to truly flex the power coursing through its veins. As someone who grew up with animation, loved animation, trained in classical animation, and invested a lot of time into animation, it pains me to admit that animation stopped working for me. What's wrong with animation nowadays? The older I got, the more animated movies seemed to fall behind. They became unrelatable. A colorful world of talking animals or inanimate objects without any real consequences just no longer reflected the depths of life's experiences. And this is why I love Spider-Verse so much and why I'm doing this series. Spider-Verse brings the limitless potential of animation to something familiar, present day set in real world New York through a lens that we've never seen before. And no, I'm not suggesting that every movie from now on needs to add halftone and chromatic aberration effects to be good. But I would love it if more animated films were at least thinking on that level. Push it. Be free. Make art. I'll never forget the words of one of my all-time favorite filmmakers, director of The Incredibles, Brad Bird. When you're doing a story, if you're really doing a story and not just repeating the last, last success, you're just, what the hell, you know, I, I think this would be cool, I hope, yeah, it sounds great, you know, I mean, you're gambling, you're gambling. In part two, I explained how Alberto Mielgo is one such artist who cares deeply about using animation to tell a different breed of films. And if you want to see what the art direction for Spider-Verse could have headed in, Look no further than Alberto's directed The Witness episode on Love, Death, and Robots. Emergency services, what's your emergency? Hello? I think I saw a murder. Location, please. I think the killer's after me. Right. I should give you a strong warning that this is absolutely not for kids. 
And honestly, it might not even be for some adults either, but it is 100% a pure glimpse of the raw, gritty, intense, visually explosive, and fully unleashed vision of Alberto Nego. It's like Spider vs. Older Brother. Clearly, I have a lot of love for Alberto's work. I mean, he's a genius, and he's one of the few artists bringing darkness, maturity, and adult themes and stories to the world of mainstream animation. And he's absolutely the guy that you want to lead your team if the goal is to shake things up. Let's take a look at some of the very first passes of the character designs. This is one of the first iterations of Miles Morales, and while things of this nature are highly subjective and you may disagree with me, I feel that something about the spirit was missing. Alberto led an initial team to create a few test shots that would set the artistic goals for the production to follow. The original Spotty was a little stockier and built like a cage fighter, whereas he eventually was stretched out to be much longer and cartoonier, with less emphasis on his muscles and more on his spider-like agility. Here we can see the progression of the design from rough animatics to test shot to final film. From these tests, we can see that the film looks a little bit different than it eventually turned out, but they communicate a vision and an aesthetic that has way more ingredients present than missing. Ultimately, Sony went with a friendlier, tamed version of Alberto's style, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. From an artistic standpoint, I love the film the way it is. So if I like the way the characters and the environments look now, then maybe Sony made the right call trying to, I assume, rein in some of the edginess of the initial test and bring back some semblance of a typical animated film. Like bringing back more cartoony, big white eyes. Inventing new art is not an exact science, and you have to balance between trying to discover something new while also not losing your audience either. Anatomically, all the characters are quite planar, very much like this John Asaro Planes of the Body statue I have on my desk. This model is meant to represent the forms of the body in its simplest construction, whereas this Scott Eaton statue is a much more naturalistic interpretation. And where a character falls along this gradient from realism to a more abstract interpretation is called stylization. In order to talk about stylization, we have to touch on a principle called straights against curves. This is a concept that I find a lot of 3D artists don't grasp, but chances are if you're a 2D artist, you've heard of it before. Essentially, Straits Against Curves is just a way to add visual interest and appeal to your work, as well as balancing stretching versus compression, and movement against rest, or gravity against energy. And the reason why 2D artists are more familiar with this is because when you're drawing, that's all you have. You only have straight lines and curves. The way to apply it to 3D is that in addition to considering the form of an object, you also have to consider its silhouette and its shape, its graphic read. So if we take a look at Gwen looking at her cell phone, her back is a curve and her leg is a straight. So even as a pose, it's applying this principle of straights versus curves. So why does this work? Like, what does that mean? Just because we have a straight and a curve? Well, it's the yin and the yang. It's pleasing to the eye to have sweeping curves, but also the firmness of straights. This creates visual contrast, forcing your eye to travel, creating a rhythm and a flow, expressing movement. And it's something to keep in mind when reproducing the Spider-Verse aesthetic. So what is the style of Spider-Verse? First you think Cruella is a devil But after time has worn away the shock You come to realize You've seen her kind of eyes Watching you from underneath a rock Spider-Verse pulls from the long-established design of Disney's early days of traditional animation. Economy of line, straights versus curves, strong readability. All of this shorthand was born in a time where hand-drawing thousands and thousands of frames demanded highly reproducible character designs. And this is where an incredible character designer like Shiyun Kim comes in. Shiyun brings classic animated appeal and design sensibility to Spider-Verse. He's a complete master of interesting shapes and forms, defined by simple, effortless line work with the same beauty and grace of calligraphy. So if you fuse together the expressive radioactive colors and lasso tool shapes of Alberto Melgo, mixed with the old school sensibility of animation design from Shiyun Kim, and brought to the original designs by Sarah Pacelli, you get something like this. Hey, you're being crazy, Mouse. You're being crazy. I'm Spider-Man! I think he really has powers. Not just any powers. Spider-Man's powers! I wouldn't, or I'll trip the gizmos you put in this suit to keep it on me. Then we all go boom. Hold your fire, man. He's right. That suit is still quite explosive. Then we all go boom. It's pretty funny to watch this stuff now, but ignoring the solid dialogue and voice acting for a second, how would you take something like this and refresh it for modern times? What would that look like? And what about the character says modern and relatable?
Why do we know that this character feels newer than this character? Let's compare Spider-Verse to Spider-Man works of the past, because in order to know where we are, we have to know where we've been. Spider-Man was first introduced as a character in August of 1962. The visual designs have to suggest to you that these characters know about the same present day world that you do. These lines and shapes tell me that they probably know what an iPhone is, while this guy probably does not. Superficially, every detail from the fashion, to the haircuts, to the gadgetry, to the colors, even the poses, is an opportunity to tell the viewer who, what, where, when, and why these characters are the way they are. There's a big difference between a Spider-Man that happens in the early 2000s versus the late 2010s. So back in the day, maybe a strong man was supposed to look like this. But in our time, we know that a strong man can look like this. So to update the visual style, you have to incorporate all the societal changes that we've been through. I propose that one of the key undercurrents in the character designs is the integration and embodiment of the current digital age. Clean shapes, crisp lines, 4K, 8K, retina display, high dynamic range, flat shapes, iconography. Spider-Verse's design is the incorporation of cell phone culture, websites, and emojis into traditional animated characters. No, it's not literally there, but the mark of technology is in the vibrant colors and perfection of the shapes. Our ability to understand and accept visual abstraction is greater than ever, and so you can afford to be less literal. We no longer have to depict a ripped superhero with accurately rendered muscles and veins to believe they are strong. It's a very energetic, cultured, and evolved style of art that acknowledges and incorporates other artworks that have come before it. Everything from comic books to Timmy Turner and Spongebob. We're also confident enough in our ability to create anything we want that we can embrace imperfections, glitches, color bleeds, burst cards, off-centered lines, deliberately imperfect circles. The scratches don't bother us anymore. It's interesting to note that despite imitating a comic book style, Spider-Verse has no outlines, which seems pretty counterintuitive. Instead, the character designs focus on minimalism. And minimalism doesn't really age over time, because solid shapes and colors are the building blocks of art. A square 100 years ago is still just a square today, and you can't really call it old. It's future-proof. So with all these considerations in mind, the Sony team boiled the characters down into simple, elegant statements that they felt breathes new life into the legacy and tells their story best. We don't really talk about this. So now it's time to put our money where our mouth is and do it ourselves. Take everything we've observed and talked about and try to put it into our model. I'm going to show you the entire 3D character creation process. So we're back in ZBrush and I'm finally getting to the face. So in the beginning you're searching for the personality and you're trying to convey the feeling that you have in your head. It's like trying to find the right actor for a role. My very first pass was completely wrong. The smallest move of the nose or change in proportion sends a completely different message. So this is where having some concept art really helps to remind you what your targets are and what checkboxes you're trying to hit. So remember, I was going for a Jamaican Filipino kid like me. So anyway, I did a paint over in Photoshop of one of the sculpts and I was kind of like, yeah, that, that's kind of the direction I want to go in. But I also wanted him to be a rookie, you know, like young, curious, vulnerable, trustworthy, down to earth, and just someone who reads as a good guy. As for the body, we left off with a really rough block out in part 2, and since then I completely revised that model to better match the proportions, posture, and silhouettes of the film. <laughs> Look at this guy, he's always naked. How about we get some... One of the most fun and quirky parts of Spider-Verse's style is the playful use of floating geometry. Check out how far the stitches are on the midsole. Then we got another red line going all along the double stitch. And then notice how the laces don't penetrate through those holes, they're just floating on top. 
If we pan over here, we can see even the sock lines are floating, so they're not built into the sock at all, as well as this gray detail line along the side. Let's see it from another angle. And here we've got an even better view of the floating parts and their distance from the surface. You can even see that there's a little space between the Nike check and the shoe. And you'll just see cool instances of this throughout the film. Keep your eye on the ball. All the lines are floating and separated. And that's such a cool touch because any other film would have textured those in. Anything else? Yeah, check out the holes on the drawstring of the hoodie. They aren't holes, it's a flat cylinder shaded with black. Modeling and simulating a real drawstring would be such a pain, with not much to show for it. So this is such a good lesson in simplification. If the pros can do it, so can you. Nearly 20 years ago, while working on Star Wars Attack of the Clones, George Lucas and his team at ILM were probably the first humans to ever come across this dilemma. While simulating Yoda's cloak, George didn't like how messy the physics was making the fabric look. Is there a way, and it, it happens throughout, for this to billow ever so slightly and not sort of wrap around them in an ugly way the way it does. Sure. It's yeah. place like this where it would catch the wind, sort of. Okay. It's much more kind of sure. the romantic version rather than the reality, the reality right. version. I mean, we can still keep some of this reality, but when he does a, a quick swing or he jumps up, rather than have the thing sort of go up over his head, it sort of goes out. Mm. And, it, there. and so there's a, we need a little bit of uh, uh, as much as anything else, sort of kind of artistic animation that is not technically correct, right. but is, is romantically correct. The takeaway is that even though the fabric simulation will give you something that's mathematically correct, you should still push for what looks and feels good instead. So how do we start making some clothes? Well, you have a few options, but I like to use a combination of Maya and Marvelous Designer. You start by cutting out real sewing patterns. You then position them in space and indicate where they should be stitched together. The program then applies real-world physics and allows you to manipulate the fabric interactively. You can really get lost trying to tweak and perfect your clothes in Marvelous, so I try to get out of there as quickly as I can. Once that's done, I bring all the objects into ZBrush, where we have much better control over the actual shape. So I tweak the silhouettes and the volumes, and then I start sculpting and refining it. And really it's a simplification process because for a stylized thing like this, there shouldn't be too many realistic wrinkles. The Jordans I modeled pretty much entirely inside of Maya. And you could model it with a lot of layers and pieces of the shoe in different parts. But again, my end goal was animation. So the sneakers are going to move and deform and squash and stretch. And one of the biggest sins of any modeler is clipping. So as much as possible, I tried to keep it one piece. I'm also a big fan, and this is a tip for Maya users, of using mash networks. So I used mash networks, curve warp deformed them onto curves for the laces, all the zippers, the floating stitches of the midsole, and the outer sole detail. What makes this tool so great is that it's procedural, which means that you can change all of its parameters dynamically and easily make adjustments. So now we've got a character model and we've got some clothes, but we still need to perfect the geometry in a process that we call retopology. Retopology is the art of organizing and reducing your polygons to be more efficient and better assist deformation during animation. It's also the process of reducing the poly count of a high poly model to be optimized for better performance during rigging, skinning, and animation. Basically, it means that we model everything over again. Yeah. As you know, our bodies can bend at specific points and to specific degrees. Our 3D topology needs to facilitate that range of motion by flowing around those natural bends. As you can imagine, this is one of the most dreaded steps of the process for character modelers. Facial retopology and edge flow is a science in itself. As the primary focal point of the viewer and the most animated part of the body, the topology needs to support the full range of human expression. Special care is given to the edge flow of the eyes, mouth, and brows. 
If we zoom in real close and we see what our sculpt looks like on the surface, you can see that it's made up of millions of these little polygons and triangles, and that's way too much to work with. And so retopology is just a matter of drawing new faces on top of your old model. But this time you can just focus purely on the organization and the flow and not the form because we know the form is what we want. Now, there are great tools to help you with retopology to make it a little bit more automatic. One in particular called ZWrap is excellent for taking pre-existing topology and graphing it onto your model. So in two clicks and a few seconds, you've got it mapped out for you, done in a fraction of the time that it would take to do manually. And I definitely explored it and I did some tests and if I was tight for time and I had a deadline to make, I would absolutely consider this as an option. But the truth is that it's just not as good as I could do myself. And in the end, manual topology will always give you a better result than automatic. Especially for stylized characters where you're deliberately trying to hold unnaturally sharp edges. For more rounded, more realistic models, this isn't as much of a concern. And every now and then as I'm working on the retopology, I like to bring it into render. Because seeing the model in a final lighting environment will give you a better sense of the mistakes or the unevenness or things that you want to try and correct. Once we've finished retopology and we've got our final mesh for our outfit and our body, it's time to give it some UVs. And basically what that means is we're trying to give every point on the surface of the 3D model a 2D coordinate. And this is what we need to do in order to texture it. Really what animation is, is, is capturing the essence of something and putting your own spin on it. Um, we're doing a movie that absolutely could be done in live action in terms of telling the story, but it couldn't tell it this way. Watch out. Here comes the Spider-Man. You like my new toy? Cost me a fortune. It's a hell of a freaking light show. You're gonna love this. It's safe to say there were more than a few challenges to overcome in making this film. But of all of them, having line work on the characters was the most groundbreaking and what I personally found the most intriguing. The ability to have 2D animation tracked onto an active 3D deforming model is unique to Spider-Verse. It's never been done before. In part one, I introduced the methods used to create the line work in Disney's short film, Paper Man. But the lines in Paper Man were not true 3D curves floating in space, but rather, they were 2D strokes overlaid on top of 3D that shifted and warped based on the underlying vectors of objects below. You can literally see a few times where the strokes clearly overshoot the model and appear to float on top. So despite being a beautiful end result, this technique is an illusion versus a fully 3D solution. In the following clip, production designer Justin Thompson walks us through the significance of using 2D line work in the film. So, Xiun designed these great characters. When you model them in CG, they just look like any other CG movie. Like, it can look just like his drawing. I mean, we can match line for line and plane for plane everything that Xiun draws. But when you model it and you light it in a traditional way, it just looks like CG. What we did, you know, you have your, tradi you have your traditional model and then you have line work that's actually controlled by the computer. Those are called form lines. You lay over <coughs> texture, and then you see these red lines. I wanted the animators to have complete control over those lines. Because when you watch, like, when you look at a comic book, so much of that is, so much of the expression of the character actually comes from the line work. It's a drawing. It's difficult to impress upon the casual observer the incredible technical achievement that Sony Imageworks pulled off. But try to imagine drawing a stick man on a piece of paper but the piece of paper is constantly moving away from you at least 12 times a second. Easy, right? Just stick it on with a piece of tape. No, because each time the paper moves, you need to draw a new, slightly different stick man. And each time the paper moves, it's no longer a flat square, but an accordion. And sometimes the accordion becomes a telephone pole. And imagine you had to do this for multiple sheets of paper, simultaneously. To top it all off, imagine doing this for 7,000 seconds straight. Suddenly drawing that stick man isn't so easy. Well, that's what Sony did. Lead animator Joshua Beveridge walks us through how. Several new techniques were made to pull this off. Animators could both pose rigged lines and hand draw new freeform lines that described acting choices and actions. The effects team created a whole machine learning process to track a library of hand drawn lines. And the lighting and compositing team created even more tools to further lay a line work to shape and describe outlines and edges. 
Machine learning is another way of saying you won't be doing this at home. The team at Imageworks used SideFX's Houdini to create a custom tool for artists to draw line work. The tool's graphics user interface was so specialized for making ink lines that artists could focus purely on their creative tasks without knowing how it worked or even how to use Houdini. In part two, I explained my thought process behind using VR to create this line work and using Quill and Oculus Rift. And while that was doable, I wanted a method that could allow me the control of using a tablet and a stylus versus drawing lines in the air inside of VR. There had to be another way, and I was pretty confident that the Sony crew weren't all popping into VR goggles just to do some line work. There wasn't any length I wasn't willing to go to to figure out a good way to do this. So I went as far as learning Blender from scratch, just to experiment with the results from the Grease Pencil tool. And I actually settled on a method for getting better control. Essentially, my method was, I used the Grease Pencil, convert that to mesh, and then export to Maya. In Maya, I made some final adjustments and cleaned up the mesh. It's not until almost the very end of the process that we start to breathe life into how a model looks. This step, known as look development or look dev, is the culmination of multiple disciplines, which includes texturing, grooming, shading, and lighting. Spider-Verse itself was rendered with Arnold and Katana, which is a lighting and look development program created internally at Sony and sold commercially by the Foundry. Aside from the line work, the Spider-Verse halftone shading is probably the biggest component of the visual aesthetic. The full white highlight halftone pattern is barely used in the film. There's only a handful of scenes where it's actually there. And you would think that it would show up in bright lighting conditions, but that's actually not a hard and fast rule either. In fact, it doesn't show up in many shots where it's overexposed. And most of the time, if there is a highlight, it's not white at all. It's closer to the color of the base color. It's important to note that Sony did not add the hatching effects in a shader. Instead, it was done in compositing, and they developed custom plugins for Nuke called Thresher and Hatcher. There are so many benefits to tackling this in post versus baking it into rendered frames, mainly non-destructive control. They can specify exactly what the effect does and in very precise areas, but we won't be getting our hands on it anytime soon. It's proprietary. So for us peasants, we gotta use a shader. Using Chad Ashley's Arnold Shader Guide as a springboard, I vastly improved on what I initially had in part two. But I built mine from the ground up, and the more that I started to understand, the more I started to change. Now, a full explanation of how this stuff works requires its own video, and we won't have time to get to it today. But I will say I think I improved on it and expanded its utility. There were some missing ingredients that I wanted to add to my shader. Firstly, the halftone effects weren't enough to describe everything we see in the film. Beneath them, the forms of the model were unlit and flat. So I injected everything into a standard Arnold surface shader, which has all the parameters like subsurface scattering, specular, and roughness that I wanted control of. When it comes to exclusive texturing programs, you really only have two choices, Substance Painter and Mari. Spider-Verse has really crisp, high-frequency detail and brushwork, and I really wanted that to come through. So I knew for sure I was gonna need to use UDIMS. And currently, Mari is the best texturing option for high-resolution UDIMS. For the first time ever, I also wanted to use an ACES CG workflow, which is the Academy Color Encoding System. When you open any art program, typically what you're used to working with is sRGB, so standard red, green, and blue. But actually, that's a very limited range of colors, and ACES actually supports every color that the human eye can see. So I had every reason to want to use this new color space, and it turned out incredible. And if you digital paint, you'll like texturing, because it's the same thing except the canvas is 3D. So yeah, the texturing was all fun in games until I got to the spider suit line work. The pattern's a lot more complex than I realized. And so the only way to do that was to study. I just looked at so many screenshots and I counted the threads on the suit. The colors we had before were just a placeholder Lambert shader. So they looked dull and washed out and boring. With textures, we can start getting some real vibrance. We'll talk deeper about this in part four, but the style of texturing in Spider-Verse is just beautiful chaos. There's a lot of rake brush and halftone patterns and scribbles and lots of hue jitter. It's also really important not to use soft airbrushes and restrict yourself to hard edge graphic brushes. The only thing I textured in Photoshop was the sticker.
The hair in Spider-Verse seems to be made like typical animation hair. The only big difference is that the hair tends to be shaded matte to better integrate with the graphic shape language of the film. That is to say, it's not nearly as shiny and sparkly as typical animated films. Instead, it opts for flatness. But even then, there's two big exceptions to that rule, and that's Gwen and Mary Jane, whose hair retains a more conventional look. This was good news for me, so that I could stick to my normal methods using Maya's X-Gen or plugins like Ornatrix or Yeti. So we can finally get rid of the block and mesh that we had at the very beginning, and instead we replace it with a hair cap. This hair cap is then used to generate curves, and we can specify where the hair should be growing and where it shouldn't. And from there, you just groom and style the hair just like you would in real life. You can cut it, you can lengthen it, you can curl it, you can twist it, braid it, everything. So my approach to the hair was anything goes. Keep it matte, keep it flat, and try to group the hair into clumps as they do in the film. And there's always this point where there's nothing more to say. Get your head in the game and get to work. I love this stuff, and I love what I do, and I love using all this different software and tools to make it happen. But the ultimate tool that I use to make this? Persistence. Just keep going. Never stop until it's right. This was a really long, hard road to put out. I don't know if I've worked on anything this hard before. I know this took me a long time, but I didn't compromise on anything, and it's exactly the way I wanted it, and now you've seen what I saw in my head. So whatever that it is for you, fire on all cylinders every single day, because time is precious and life is short. There is no substitute for hard work. It's taking on something difficult that makes it interesting. Something that can fail. And Sony proved that to us too. So that's it guys, we got a lot done. I have one more installment for this series to put it all together. And then we all go boom. <laughs>